Okay. Welcome everyone. The October 12th meeting of the Faculty Senate will come to order. We do have a quorum, but before we launch into the agenda, I have just a few reminders. I'd like to ask all senators and attendees to identify themselves with their first and last names. To change your name, click on the three dots that appear in your Brady Bunch frame. You should see the option to, to change your name once you click on those three dots. When the time comes for questions, senators may use the audio feature to ask a question or they may use the chat. Senators who raise their hands to speak will be recognized first. Um, to raise your hand, click on the participants link at the bottom of your screen uh, and you should see the hand raise option. Um, and speaking of questions or comments, my parliamentarians tell me that individual senators are permitted to speak no more than two times on any one motion. So I will be instituting this rule during this meeting. So if there's a motion on the floor and you've already offered comments twice, uh, I will not be recognizing you for a third time. Later on in the agenda, we will have some for approval items. And when the time comes to vote on the agenda items or motions, I'll ask senators to use the hand raise feature to vote. And lastly, uh, senators and panelists, if you aren't speaking, be sure to mute your microphone, your microphone or it shall be muted for you. Okay, so our first order of business is the approval of the minutes from our September 14th Senate meeting. The September 14th meeting minutes have been distributed as an annex to your agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes from the September meeting? Okay, hearing no corrections, the meetings or the minutes from the September meeting are approved as written. So our next uh, item on our agenda is a report from Provost Reed. Thank you, Natalie. Good afternoon, everyone. And I wanna begin by um, echoing the same senti sentiments uh, that you heard from the president, which is that we are really appreciative of um, how you have our faculty have uh, been so flexible and adaptable uh, during an incredible time of disruption. Um, and uh, we've ha asked you to pivot three times <laughs> this semester, which is, which is you know, a lot, and we recognize that. But we do believe, we hope that we are in the home stretch to finish out the semester um, with our current mix of uh, in-class instruction and online. Our two and a half week, most mostly a shutdown period um, combined with stricter enforcement of student behavior has led to a significant reduction in uh, positive COVID cases for the past seven days. Um, those numbers in Morgantown have been in the single digits. And right now we have 160, well, as of Sunday, 160 students that are quarantined, 33 in isolation, um, and only seven students in Arnold Hall. And if you recall, at the height of, um, at the height of this, when we had these uh, incredible uh, increase in cases, we had almost 1,500 students that were either in isolation or in quarantine. So, um, you know, we feel very good about where we're at, and we feel like there's a good chance that we can finish out this semester in the way that we uh, plan to. Um, we know that managing this this situation is also dependent on us doing a lot of testing and we have significantly increased uh, the amounts of testing that we're doing and so we are now up to about 600 tests pcr tests a day or about 2500 tests a week and we anticipate increasing that even more in the spring as the hospital can begins to do its own testing and as we have um, antigen tests of, available. So um, I do want to just talk a little bit about testing. There was some confusion uh, due to some uh, mix up in emails that were sent to faculty. I want to be very clear on the type of testing that is available to faculty. Um, so the first kind of testing uh, is voluntary. And uh, there are two groups that are eligible for that. One is faculty who are teaching in person. 
Um, you are eligible to have a test once a week and you can schedule that Monday through Friday uh, from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon at the rec center. If you, uh, and then there's voluntary testing for any faculty. And in fact, you can bring your children um, to the community testing, which uh, happens every Wednesday at the rec center. And that is done on a drop-in basis. Now there's mandatory testing, and that is for faculty who have been identified for screening testing. Um, and that uh, decision was made by the, uh, the deans, the, the chairs, and in consultation with our healthcare professionals. And these are uh, people who have been identified for testing because they have a lot of interaction with students, um, or the type of work that they do, um, you know, increases the, uh, the chance of spreading or, or contracting the virus. Um, and some of them, uh, you know, faculty may be front facing uh, with the community. And so um, those tests are mandatory. Um, the frequency of them depends on the group. And again, what has been uh, identified by those various people about uh, you know, how often a, a, a particular type of faculty should be tested, but that is mandatory. So um, just want to make sure I think some uh, in person faculty got the mandatory message. Uh, but in fact, uh, in person faculty, unless you've been identified to be screened, um, that is voluntary. Um, want to talk a little bit about spring, the spring semester. Our planning uh, is well underway. And I want to say that um, in part because of the feedback that we received from faculty, um, faculty senate leadership, that our office is, um, is really giving more control to the colleges on how they approach the mix of face-to-face -face and online instruction. Um, because we're recognizing that the academic units uh, know the best way to deliver the curriculum. Um, and so rather than mandating, um, a, you know, a type of uh, mode of instruction, we are uh, issuing, we issued guidelines and guardrails that we're calling them, uh, which is really our preference. Uh, we would love to see, um, you know, the, the preserving uh, of the on-campus experience as much as possible for, again, for freshmen, for graduate students, and for graduating seniors. Um, who may need certain courses face-to-face -face, uh, in order to really finish out their degree programs um, effectively. Um, we, are, uh, we were asking if we could see an increase in uh, synchronous online instruction, if possible, because again, that seems to be something that our, we're hearing from our students and our parents that they would like to see more of. Um, and then our only hard stop really uh, was uh, that we set limits on the class size uh, based on the ability, uh, the classrooms that are available and are, are need to, to social distance. So um, the preliminary uh, schedules came in from the academic units uh, last Monday. Uh, we've been putting those into the system um, and we do have uh, a draft of the schedule. Um, this week we'll be working with the academic units to fine tune that and then the schedule will, will be released on October 20th. Um, what we are seeing so far is a, a mix of instruction pretty similar to what we saw this fall um, in terms of that balance between you know the majority of courses being offered online um, and then the rest being offered face-to-face -face or hybrid. I will say that what we're seeing right now is a, is a slight increase in face-to-face -face instruction um, which kind of surprised us but um, at any rate uh, that is what we're seeing so far. Um, I want to remind our faculty uh, and instructors, and that includes graduate assistants, that they can continue to ask for accommodations that may include um, an all, all online schedule. If that faculty member instructor has a significant health concern, um, then they can request an accommodation. And our new streamlined process for requesting accommodations has been updated on the WVU faculty website. And we are asking that faculty and instructors submit their requests and supporting document, docu documentation by no, uh, Sunday, November 1st for the spring 2021 semester. And that will allow, again, uh, the units to uh, more carefully plan for spring and make those adjustments. 
One thing that is still in play, and I just wanted to let you know, is, is the possibility of starting our semester online. We uh, currently, our plans are to start the semester on January 19th, um, you know, normal face-to-face, -face, you know, the regular mix of what we would be offering in the spring. But we have to uh, think about the testing that we plan to do at the beginning of the semester and whether we actually need um, additional time to do that and whether we want to start out online. So um, those conversations are happening now. And I would tell you that as soon as we can make that decision again, um, you know, in consultation with our public health uh, folks, we will share that with you. Um, but that is kind of the one thing I think that is still a bit in play. Um, also, we will have uh, up and running a web page that has for, for students that identifies all the modalities and how to look at your schedule and know exactly what that means, whether you're in the classroom, face-to-face, -face, or online. Online synchronous, online asynchronous. Um, we continue to provide support to faculty. Um, you know, we, we are very focused on, and we have been on childcare, recognizing that that's an issue that is, um, you know, of, of, of a real challenge for some of our faculty. And we heard that in the, uh, the questions that were asked of President Gee. Um, so reminding folks, we have the Child Care Emergency Fund that uh, supports, provides financial support for those families or faculty that have significant financial impacts because of child care. Uh, we uh, have had a great deal of demand for the tutoring that we are offering. Um, and this is tutoring for dependent children um, of faculty and staff. Uh, we actually uh, have run out of tutors. <laughs> so we're now recruiting more tutors. Um, and we hope to be able to have those available and to, to really s serve everyone's needs uh, very, very soon. And then a reminder that um, if you, again, feel like your the, the childcare, um, you know, responsibilities are making it very difficult for you to do your research or, you know, whatever you need to get uh, tenure, that you can apply for an extension of your tenure clock based upon that. Uh, but a reminder, you can only have three extensions of a tenure clock um, overall prior to going up for tenure. And then, of course, we're asking our academic leaders to continue to be flexible around those, uh, the scheduling needs of faculty, um, in part because of those kind of personal needs. Um, and then I wanted to share with you that uh, the demand for mental health services through the faculty and staff um, assistance program has been very high, and we're going to be adding another counselor. Um, so that we can, uh, you know, support our faculty as well as our students, right? It's, it's our students are, are experiencing uh, stress and strain, but so are our faculty. Um, I want to just talk briefly about retention. So, uh, as you know, or as you may know, last year we identified um, improving retention as a strategic priority. Um, recognizing that retention is both the uh, right thing to do to help our students uh, stay in school, but it's also the smart thing to do in terms of cost savings. Um, and so we are, you know, as we're returning to somewhat of a normal environment um, or the new normal, we are returning to our uh, retention efforts. Um, and so I just want to tell everyone that, uh, remind everybody that we had seen an increase in our first time freshmen a retention from last year of uh, a little over 3%. Um, so our retention uh, from last year, uh, it was almost 83%. Pretty high. Uh, we know that that was uh, part of the, the, the contributing factors are our, uh, easing up on some academic policies, including um, offering uh, the pass-fail option um, and suspending our academic suspensions. But even so, we know that we had an increase of at least 1% um, regardless. And that's, that's really positive. That speaks a lot to our efforts and to the efforts of our faculty and our advisors. Uh, we have retained the services of Torchstar. That was the consultant that came last spring and talked to, to, to Senate about uh, the stay survey that they conducted for us. And uh, they worked closely with a WVU committee of faculty and administrators to develop for us a three-year retention roadmap. Um, 
And this draws from successful retention efforts at six peer land grant universities, and they offered several practical steps that we can take. So, um, you know, we, we plan to charge a retention committee that will be again comprised of faculty and administrators, particularly those that are dealing with, um, you know, with students um, through advising um, and to address a number of these areas that include things like lowering DFW rates, streamlining scheduling and registration, enhancing um, academic services, creating better pathways to graduation. We will be reaching out, uh, Evan Witters will be reaching out to your deans and associate deans and asking the colleges to identify faculty members who are engaged and interested in student support and uh, the best practices and pedagogy. And so we should have a fairly large committee that will begin tackling some of these issues. Um, recognizing that retention is everybody's problem, <laughs> it's everybody's opportunity because um, we all interact with students in some way. Um, I do want to offer that if you would like, and, and we can talk to, to Natalie, we can, uh, Torch Star is willing to come and share, you know, this, what they, what they have envisioned for us uh, with all of you, um, as they did around the state survey. Um, and then finally, I just want to remind everybody that the WVU travel guidelines are still in effect. Um, we've had a couple of issues with that. So just to remind everybody that um, even though we know that financially we have not, uh, the units have not really um, been able to support a lot of faculty travel, the travel effect, uh, the travel uh, guidelines are still in effect, meaning that if you leave the country for any reason and return, you have to quarantine for 14 days. And if you leave the state, um, and uh, not for commuting purposes, but you leave the state, uh, you know, and you come back that you're supposed to quarantine for five days. And I just want to remind everybody about that. Um, that's my report. I'm happy to take questions. I have a question. Is that oh. Asad Dawari from WVU? All right, very good. Go ahead. Regarding the, the uh, test, voluntary test, particularly for those face-to-face. -face. I was wondering if this is also available for other campuses. For instance, I met the student five times a week. Now, I would like to have tested every now and then. Yes, and I'm so sorry that, um, Dr. Devari, that I can't answer that for you right now, but I will be happy to, to find that out and, um, and make sure that, that that is provided to you in, in Natalie's mm -hmm. report. Um, also, the retention and the percentage, is it for only main campus or for other campuses? That is actually for main campus. So we are now carefully looking at the retention of the other campuses as well. And we will engage, we will engage the other campuses in our retention efforts. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Just a quick reminder, so if you have a question or a comment, be sure to raise your hand first, uh, unless you post it in the chat. And that way folks are queued up and um, you're not jumping the line. Just pretend you know, you're in line uh, at the Law College uh, waiting to speak to the provost or whoever else is a panel panelist. Thank you very, very much. Okay, so I see uh, Rose Casey's hand just raised. Rose, um, go ahead. Hi, yes. Um, Provost Reed, please could you talk about how the WVU administration is responding to the Trump administration's September the 22nd executive order against anti-racist and anti-sexist diversity training? Yeah, happy to talk about that. So um, that's exactly it. It's the executive order. The title is Executive Order on Combating Race and Sex Stereotyping. I can tell you what I know. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly how this will impact the institution. Um, our understanding is that the order impacts federal agencies and uh, departments as well as federal contractors. Um, and it's an order that pertains to diversity trainings and seminars related to workforce development. Um, our general counsel believes that it pertains uh, to primarily to work that is funded by federal grants. 
Um, but we, again, we don't have a lot of information about this. It's very broad, uh, the executive order. Um, it uses really broad language. It doesn't exactly say what you can and can't do. Um, so we are studying that. We hope to have more information. The order takes effect November 22nd. Um, and we believe after the election is when we will get more clear information about it, uh, depending on which side wins. Um, and I will say that what I know right now is that diversity trainings that are being conducted by DEI and academic affairs will continue as planned. Um, WVU, of course, remains committed to creating and nurturing a culture that is diverse, inclusive, and supportive. Um, but we are carefully monitoring the situation along with other universities to figure out exactly how it will impact us. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the next person who has her hand raised is Andrea Sikorsi. Andrea, go ahead, please. Hello. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, thank you, Provost Reed, for your report. I had a question concerning those of us who have been identified for testing, and I believe uh, that you mentioned it before, but my question concerns the availability of testing on the downtown campus, uh, perhaps the ballrooms. Would that be available? I know that uh, some students have um, asked about possible testing on the downtown campus as well. Thank you. Sure. My understanding right now is that it that that we are not able to um, to spread out on two campuses. That really that the rec center is the primary area for testing, and that we're offering a lot of it there. Um, but what I will do is I will certainly inquire and see if there is that opportunity to do that, even if it's once a week. I just I can't promise that. Thank you. Yep. It looks like there might be a question in the uh, chat, Drew Nix. And uh, there's um, just yep. Operations Working Group and uh, eCampus update questions. Yes, you, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, please. Yeah, I'll do the eCampus first. So, um, Provost Reed, um, so myself, like a lot of people, obviously, on this call are, are involved in online teaching. And I, I'm 50 50. I have one um, large class online, and then I have a, a student. Uh, senior capstone class that's in person, which is going fairly well, by the way. <laughs> it's yeah. tough to manage people around the, around different garages and stuff. But anyway, on eCampus, so I am involved in um, my first exam grading uh, of a large class, and eCampus is just um, throwing up a lot of difficulties um, in terms of glitches in the system and and simple things like default color and line weight of a pen that you use to grade on a tablet or something. And so I've been talking with IT about it. But my question is, did you know, um, is there a plan in the near term for uh, a large eCampus update to fix a lot of these issues that have been reported? You know, uh, Drew, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to see, I'm going to ask, is Tracy Beckley, are you on this? by any chance? I didn't see her. She might need to be promoted. Yeah, let's see if she can share with us. I might be able to offer a little help with that. Oh, oh great. Thanks, Paul. So we are aware of issues that are happening. We thought they were resolved, but uh, there's uh, issues with grade syncing and, mm -hmm. and other things related to eCampus. And um, <clears throat> we're still working through those. A campus went through a major update uh, this summer and everything is in the cloud. We're, it's probably a result of something that got uh, overlooked during that transition. Um, what's one thing that we're going to do is we're going to uh, postpone the deadline for uh, issuance of midterm grades until Wednesday at noon. And so that's something we're trying to work out right now, but they'll have to get back to you with more detail on exactly what the problems are and the fixes are. Okay, thanks, Paul. I just, I, like I said, I've been working with, uh -huh. with the TLC folks. They're, they're great. They're, they've been so, so good and so helpful. And then even the folks at IT, you know, are, yeah, we're aware of the issue, but, we, you know, we'll try to promote it up, but we're not sure when we'll get another update. And so it's, it's little tiny things that take time. And when you add them and multiply by 100 or 200, turn right. into hours, yeah. right? So, um, Anyway, I th thank you for the info. And then the other question I had was the operations working group. So I, I was invited to that, but I haven't been able to attend a meeting. I think I was invited like a week ago. Um, is just is that an effort to try to get 
faculty involved in a lot of these high level decisions. So I really applaud you on that. I, yes. I'm sorry I haven't been able to make it yet because it's, it's like an hour before my class, but I do plan to be available in the future. And I think that the rest of the faculty senators who aren't, I, mean, I don't know who all was invited um, whether I'm special or it's just a lot of people. I think, invited, I think but, there was another faculty member was invited to operate. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I do plan to attend those and, and I do applaud you guys for involving some faculty in those high level decisions. We are. Thank so, you for that, yep. Drew. And in fact, you know, we are, we are going to be, actually, I think the, the working groups are published uh, on our website as they are, but we're starting to add faculty to the non-academic uh, groups because we heard loud and clear that faculty want a greater participation. Great. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. the time. Absolutely. It looks like there's a question from um, Ruchi Bhandari. Can you also synchronize the grades with Sol so we don't have to manually type for each student? So it's a health sciences question. Yeah, I'm not sure. Would Paul be able to answer that or? I don't know. Paul can answer that. I don't know if Louise, Louise is Louise on the call? Louise Veselecki? Paul, do you want to try to? I, I cannot answer that question. I would assume that that's a, a question for the IT uh, director for the Health Sciences Campus. Uh, I would ask you to direct your question to that person. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for Provost Reed? Looks like there's a question, it's another uh, ITS eCampus kind of question. Um, from Roy Nutter, can we leave the students in the eCampus gradebook once they withdraw? Roy, um, I, I can I can answer that one. Uh, no, unfortunately, we cannot. <laughs> this is Evan Winters, by the way. Um, yeah, that that's been a consistent issue with with federal compliance on recording the dates of withdrawal. Um, once they do withdraw, they, they fall out of the campus. There may be at some point a banner fix we can do, but those are always time consuming and quite frankly can be as ex expensive as well. So even though that's on our list of known banner e-campus issues, um, we don't have a fix for that in process right now. Other questions? Okay. So next up is my report. Um, we were going to have a presentation on ADA accessibility from Aaron Kelly and Dan Long, and then vote on a resolution, um, which on your agenda is Annex 1A, but it's come to my attention that some revisions need to be made to the resolution. So we'll be tabling that presentation and resolution until the November or December Senate meeting. And as soon as the, um, the revisions, the changes are resolved, then the resolution will be presented at Senate. So at our last Senate meeting, we passed a resolution to form an ad hoc committee on investigating the use of third party platforms. Uh, that committee has been formed and met for the first time last week. Um, members, current members are Ramana Reddy, Diana Davis, Ian Harmon, Lori Ogden, who's also chair, Heather Billings, Mark Fullen, Fullen uh, Megan Light, Amelia Jones, and Chase Riggs. As for other committees, you may recall that at the July 28th Faculty Senate meeting, uh, I mentioned that there had been a working group of senators who met over the summer to provide feedback on WVU's return to campus. Um, that group continues to meet uh, now biweekly with Lou Slimak, and because it continues to meet, it's being formalized as a special committee and uh, and it, its work will continue for at least the uh, next academic year. So that is what is uh, uh, item 17 on our agenda, the um, uh, resolution to create that special committee. But we'll get that to that in uh, a little bit. Finally, just one reminder, at the November Senate meeting, Stephanie Taylor and Ryan Watson from Legal will be presenting um, and sharing information about teaching materials and intellectual property rights. That concludes my report. Are there any questions for me? One, did I see a hand? Uh, Julie Tallman, do you have a question? Mm 
Nope, we're just renaming someone. <laughs> Very good. Okay, uh, hearing no questions, I will move on to uh, item 11, since we're skipping 10, the curriculum committee report. Jennifer, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> If I get my video to work, it's coming. Here we go. <laughs> yes, did you want to take these um, one at a time, Natalie, or just, just kind of put out for questions and vote all at once? What do you prefer? Yes, so we'll combine the four, four approval items into a single votable measure, but if you wouldn't mind introducing them, that would be terrific. Okay, so Annex 1 is the new courses report. Okay, Annex 2, course changes. And then we have two new programs for approval. There's the new degree program in early childhood special ed, and the new major in technical studies, it's carpentry tech at Potomac State. Okay, are there any questions or points of discussion for Annex 1, the new course report, Annex 2, the course changes report, or the new degree program in early childhood special education, or the new major in technical studies, carpentry technology? Okay, hearing no questions, we will move to a vote. All those in favor of approving Annexes 1 and 2, uh, the new degree program and new major, please raise your hand and remember to raise your hand, go to the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and you should see um, how to raise your hand there. Okay, still voting. Okay, so it's more than enough. It looks like there are 89, yes, votes, 92, it's a lot, okay. Yes, votes. I'm putting it in the chat so you all can see. Um, Julie, can you clear the hands? Uh, all those opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any. I'm not seeing any no's. Okay, so the um, four approval items pass. Next is our uh, General Education Foundations Committee report. Uh, Lisa D. Bartolomeo, are you ready? Yes, I am, Madam Chair. Uh, we have, well, we have a spooky Halloween background, but we have uh, no courses that we've currently gotten ready to, to pass at Senate level, but I can also report that we're about to start uh, a sort of audit or a survey of uh, courses, not only that are within the Jeff, but also broadly across the university that have some social, social justice, diversity, or e equity uh, element to them. And so we're gonna be working on that with uh, Lou Slimak. Are there any questions for Lisa D. Bartolomeo on any Jeff related initiatives? Okay, hearing no questions, we will move on to the Committee on Committees, uh, Membership and Constituencies Report. Uh, and uh, oh, we'll be hearing from the Committee Chair's Proxy, Emery Hibbert. Emery, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> it worked this time. So we just have one approval item, Annex 3. It's just an updated ra roster for the Faculty Welfare Committee. Are there any comments or questions for uh, Emory and the Committee on Committees? Okay, all those in favor of Annex 3, please raise your hand.
sorry about that. It looks like there are 84 yeses. Um, Julie, can you clear the hands? Uh, any opposed? It looks like one no. Okay, one no vote. Thank you. Okay, um, Annex three passes. Next is our um, report from the Faculty Senate Representative to State Government, Roy Nutter. Are you ready, Roy? I am, um, thank you. Uh, Roy Nutter, Statler College, and your representative to State Government, which includes the State Advisory Council of Faculty. Um, couple notes, we met last Thursday, online of course, and um, the two things I, that came out of that that are kind of interesting, the biggest complaint probably statewide was internet access for students and of all things for faculty. Apparently um, faculty across the state uh, are having the same issues the students do with, with access. The number two thing that was talked about the most was um, faculty and student mental health. So um, Provost's comments about the mental health is right on target. The other report from uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Corley Dennison was about the ACT exam information, I think, I guess from last year. Uh, but the uh, data showed that of all the people taking ACT, 29% uh, of them checked off the book box for uh, health sciences careers, 30%. Think about that. 16% were undecided, 9% for science, 8% in engineering, 9% for social studies and law. But that 30%, I think, is a reflection probably of COVID, but it's coming, and I don't know that we're, we're watching that closely. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, comments, points of discussion for Roy? OK. So Martin, I, there is someone with their hand raised. I don't know if they need anything or not. On the panelist side, Mark Fullen. Mark, go ahead. I don't know why my hand was raised. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing those hands, Julie, so I'm not sure what's happening. Okay, okay. I just lowered it. Thanks. Um, so a uh, couple of quick things. Um, I mistakenly skipped over the teaching and assessment committee re uh, report. So we'll go back and do that. But before we do that, just one quick point of correction for the um, committee on committees uh, annex that we just voted on. There uh, should be 85 yeses and no no. So there was a, a residual uh, hand raised when I called for the no vote. Okay, so um, going backwards on the agenda, apologies, Jessica, is uh, so item 13, the Teaching and Assessment Committee report. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so I just wanted to provide everyone with a brief update on the early semester teaching assessment results. Um, so as you may recall, the survey closed on Thursday, October 1st, and late last week, we were provided with some preliminary data. Um, so overall, it was a healthy response rate. Uh, we had over 360 uh, instructors, unique instructors, uh, chose to opt in, and that included um, 800 and 783 course sections. Um, and so we will be providing Senate with a more complete report in November, um, but I just wanted folks to know that the average scores were uh, very high. We did receive the highest scores uh, with regard to communicating course goals and objectives. Um, and not so surprisingly, um, the, lower the lowest score of, of all of the 
agreement questions was with regard to engagement. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to share is that TACO will be distributing a uh, feedback form. Um, we want to hear from instructors who chose both to participate and those who chose not to participate because we are working on some minor adjustments to the spring version of the assessment. So when you receive that email on Thursday morning, uh, please encourage your colleagues to uh, respond to it. it. It should take around five minutes to complete uh, because again it's going to help us inform the next iteration of it. Um, and that's all I had, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions for Taco? Okay, moving on. Back down to item 16, Board of Governors report, Stan Heilman. Stan, are you re ready? I am. So the board met on September 18th uh, for its public meeting. Of course, there was committee meeting, meetings the day before that and, and that day as well. Um, but in the public meeting, we received a report from Cindy Roth and Rich Kreish on the foundation and foundation investments. The uh, um, foundation has done really uh, an amazing job of raising money this year, given the current COVID environment and economic state of things. Um, we received our usual COVID updates is what all was going on here at the university and dealing with it. Uh, an update on uh, several capital projects and then uh, announcement of some transfer of property on the Montgomery campus, which is always a good thing um, as that's leaving our purview and, and going to various entities down there. And then finally, a uh, report on affordability of educational materials for students. Um, and that was the public meeting. Our next meeting, uh, public meeting, will be on November 6th. And that concludes my report. Other questions for Stan? Okay, on to item 17, a four approval item, a resolution to create a special committee. That's Annex 4. And Ashley Martucci will be introducing the resolution. As Natalie mentioned in our report, the Special Committee on COVID-19 Planning serves as a formal recognition of a committee that began meeting this summer. So far, the committee has provided feedback on syllabus policies and teaching assessment as they have related to COVID. Currently, the committee meets bi-weekly and the members are Robin Hism, Scott Critchlow, Sherry Chisholm, Lori Ogden, Dave Hauser, Emily Murphy, Natalie St. Corcoran, Stan Heilman, Roy Nutter, Lou Slimak, and I. The committee will be adding additional Senate and non-Senate members. Natalie, do you wanna share your screen or do you want me to just read it? How about that? Hold on, let me see if I can get it. Get the right, you see the resolution? Yes. yes. Okay. The resolution to create an ad hoc committee on COVID-19 planning. Whereas the faculty constitution authorizes the faculty senate by resolution to establish special committees. And whereas the faculty senate seeks to assist the university in planning and implementing of COVID related policies and practices that affect West Virginia University faculty. Therefore be it resolved that the Faculty Senate Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19 Planning is created as a special committee for the 2020-2021 academic year, unless sooner altered or terminated by resolution of the Faculty Senate, and be it resolved that the Faculty Senate Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19 Planning be charged with undertaking the following set of actions. One, advise the provost on matters related to research, teaching, and service, that because of exigent, <laughs> yeah, require input and action outside of the normal Senate calendar. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Okay, are there any questions or points of discussion on the resolution? Is there a, a second? 
on uh, on an approval uh, for voting. Second. Okay, thank you. Can you clear that hand, Julie? Thank you. Okay, all those in favor of Annex 4, the resolution to create a special committee on COVID-19 planning, please raise your hands. Okay, I see 88 yes votes. Julie, could you clear the hands again? Are there any opposed? Please raise your hand. Okay, it looks like we have one opposed. The resolution to create a, a special committee on COVID-19 planning uh, passes. So on to our next agenda item. Is there any new business? Okay, no new business. Is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? I can. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Okay. okay, very good. We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.